The salvation that God brings us. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to sing about that today. Of how God has done this incredible thing and he's invited us into it. And so I, I want to thank each of you for, for your part in this. Uh, for, for your financial support, your prayer support, your volunteer support. Some, some of our volunteers just did some incredible jobs. In fact, all of them did an incredible job. But uh, we're so thankful that we were able to go and, and just have this, this incredible time. Thank you each for this. Um, so here, here's one of the things uh, about a music festival. I don't know this would be a surprise. And some of you are like, wow, really? At a music festival, they had music. I know. I know. It's shocking. You're like, wow, I'm so glad I came to church today. I learned something already. Yeah, there, there's music at a music festival. Let, let me ask real quick, crowd participation. How many of you are, are music lovers? You, you like music? Yeah, that's, that's almost every hand. That is awesome. Bunch of music lovers. So I, I want you to think about maybe your favorite group, your favorite band, your, your favorite artist, and um, just think about them right now. And you might have to narrow them down. Maybe you're thinking OCC Worship. That's one of my favorites. It really is, right? Uh, and, and on the count of six, because it's going to take you a few more seconds to figure this out. On the count of six, I want you just to yell out your favorite group, band, or, or, or artist. Okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, one, six. <laughs> Okay, there was a whole bunch of stuff in there. The one I heard loudest was for King and Country, the, from, from this group over here especially, and wherever Renee is right now. Uh, she's probably working with kids' ministry or something. For King and Country is, is one of those, those groups. How many of you have ever heard of For King and Country? A few of you? Yeah, probably, probably, once again, at least half of us. And then the other half, just, I'm not participating anymore. I'm done. I'm done raising my hand in church. I'm not that kind of Christian, right? So, For King and Country is one of those bands that, that, that was there. And uh, they, in fact, if you were to compile some of their greatest hits, they would have their own mixtape, right? We've been talking about mixtapes. They, they've got so many great songs, like Run Wild and Fix My Eyes, which, by the way, Fix My Eyes is not for eye doctors. That's, it's not all about that. So, Fix My Eyes, I was reading that earlier. It's like, if I were just reading the titles, it would seem a little strange to me. But that's not what it's all about. Priceless, proof uh, of your love, joy, and oh God, forgive us. There's so many great songs. You've probably heard a lot of them on the radio. And even if you don't recognize any of those titles, if you were to play some of those, you'd be like, oh yeah, that sounds familiar. Well, here's one of the cool things. Uh, because we, we go uh, as a group, we, we offer prizes to some of the kids and stuff. Um, and, and, and a lot of our, our, our students were able to meet some of these artists uh, either at a meet and greet or even riding roller coasters and, and, and on some of the rides. That was pretty cool. We, we met some. It was, it was pretty awesome. So some of our kids had an opportunity to meet the lead singers for King and Country, and they were able to shoot us this special video. So check this out. Obi Community Church, Joel and Luke here with the King and Country. Yes, and uh, hopefully we can see your entire church come to Kingdom Bound uh, next time. I think we're coming back next year. So. I don't know if it's yeah. announced yet, but I think it's going to be tonight. <laughs> See you soon. Yeah, bye bye. Woo Isn't that pretty cool? You got a special invite for for King and Country, and, and it's going to be pretty awesome next year. We're already planning on it. It's going to be a great lineup. Uh, I'm I'm really excited about next year already. So here's the thing: many of us were were music lovers. We we love music. So so I wanted to pick some uh, some psalms, or at least one particular psalm <coughs> this week that talked about music. Now, music is one of those things. That, that we're drawn to. For some reason, we're drawn to. We love to sing, we love to dance, we, we love to get a little bit crazy even at times. There's something about music that we're drawn to. In fact, uh, you've probably heard this quote before by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Ever heard of him? Here, here's, here's a quote that, that, that he had. It says, music is the universal language of mankind. How many of you have heard that before? It's the universal language of mankind. I know you're raising your hand a whole lot. I'm just warming you up for something that's gonna happen a little bit later, okay? So, music is the universal language of mankind. That's Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And there's been several that have come along after him that have kind of had some spin-off quotes from that particular one. One is uh, Bert, Berthold, Berthold Auerbach. I'm not sure if I pronounced his name right. He's long gone, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but anyway, this is... I'm sorry, that I was disrespectful, I know. We'll get over it. All right, so here's what he said. He said, music is the only universal language which needs no translation. And there's no translation. You can just hear it and you can, you, can, you can feel and experience the beauty of music. David O. McKay said this, that music is truly the universal language. And when it's excellently expressed, 
how deeply it moves our souls. Right? This, this is one of the things that draws us every week on a Sunday morning is because music is done and it's done with excellence and it, and it moves our souls. There, there, there's another guy that, that talked about this. He's a lot less, less known. Uh, his name is uh, David Cook. Um, uh, this, this is what this guy says. He, he says that music is the universal language of mankind. Why? Because the creator of the universe and the creator of mankind is the creator of music. See, God, our creator, who created all of us, created everything we see and everything that we don't see, he came up with music. It's all his idea. And it's a pretty powerful thing when you think about it. See, I believe that God is a music lover. He loves it. Over and over again throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it talks about singing songs to our God and worshiping and praising our God with our voices. See, God is a music lover. And today we're going to look at some scripture that points to the reality that God is a music lover. So go ahead and turn to Psalm 98. Psalm 98. If you're using one of our Bibles, it's page 483. 483. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that one home with you. Psalm 98. See, we're in this series called Summer Mixtape, Deep <coughs> Tracks from, from the Psalms. And we're looking at some of the lesser known Psalms, mostly, right, Andy? Mostly some of the lesser known Psalms. And these psalms are essentially this, this ancient playlist of music and uh, songs and poems. And, and, and many, if not most scholars, uh, believe that these songs were actually put to music. And, and, and many of them would have been sung by the nation of Israel for, for generations. And so we're looking at some of these psalms. And, and here's one I want us to focus on today. It's just such a beautiful psalm. Psalm 98. We're going to look at it and then we're going to talk about it. Psalm 98. Listen. It says, Sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with a harp, with a harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the, mute, or let the mountains sing for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the peoples with equity. It's such a beautiful song isn't it? Well, we're going to break this up into kind of two different sections, two different main points, if you will, and then I'll have some sub points underneath those just to kind of help organize some of our thoughts together. That's why we do points and sub points, just to help organize uh, the thoughts. And so I'm going to break it up into two different sides. So side A, side B, kind of go along with our, our theme uh, for this summer mixtape. Side A is this. God is into new worship. God is into new worship. So let's dive kind of headfirst into these song lyrics. I'm going to focus just a little bit on this first section. Psalm 98, the first part of verse 1 says this. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord a new song. Now why a new song? Why sing to the Lord a new song? It, it's, you know, I mean, of all the words he could have chose, he said, I, I want new songs. Sing to the Lord a new song. Listen, I believe that God is into new stuff. You know that? I believe that God is into new stuff. In fact, Scripture tells us that one day, God will make all things new. God is into new things. One day, God will even create a new heaven and a new earth. And I, I'm here to tell you, it's going to be stunning. It will be flawless. What we see in, in our creation, and we've seen some beautiful things, right? You guys who just traveled from out west, there's some beautiful things there, right? There are some, some incredible things that, that, that we see in creation. But listen, it is a pale representation of what God originally created. And God is going to create all things new, and it is going to be incredible. God is into new stuff. If you're a follower of Christ, Scripture says that you're a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. We have some new creations in our church because of what God did at Kingdom Hearts. The old is gone and the new has come. God is into new things. 
<clears throat> so I think it's only fitting that we sing to the Lord a new song. So let me give you three reasons why I believe that God is into new worship. <clears throat> number one is this. This is track number one. Track one is God created us to be creators. God created us to be creators. Listen, God is the creator. Capital C, creator. He is the creator. And he spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke the world into existence. He spoke, and trees formed. He spoke, and the sun was made, and the stars were made, and the moon was made, and all the planets were made. He just spoke them into existence, because he is the creator. He spoke the world into existence. He, he spoke animals and plants into existence. All these new and wonderful and unique things. In fact, we're still discovering, when I say we, I mean scientists, we're still discovering new things, new plants, new animals. I wonder if God sometimes is, is in heaven just waiting for us to discover one of his creations. He's like, you still haven't found it. Keep looking. Keep looking. Keep digging around. Keep exploring. And then we find this new thing. We're like, man, we found this. We've never seen this. This is completely new. And God is like, finally. I got some. I got some more things for you too. Keep looking for them. God created all of these things. One of the things He created is us. And when He created us, He made us different than everything else. He made us in the image of Himself. We are created in the image of God. And since we're created in the image of God, we too have a little bit of creativity in us. That's a part of being created in God's image. See, in some ways, we too are creators with a small c. Not a capital C creator, but we too are creators. <coughs> That's why we love to design and engineer and build buildings. It's because God created us to create. It's one of the reasons why we love to draw and paint and sculpt and do things that are artistic. Is because we were created to create. It's why we love to write stories and to make music and to sing, because we were created to create. So God is into new songs, because we've been created to make them. In fact, what's interesting to me is, is that with all of the songs that have ever been written, people are still able to make brand new songs. Does that... Does that Blow anybody else's mind? I think about that once a month. I hear a new song, I'm like, man, that was fantastic, and I'm so deeply moved by this new music, and I'm like, how do we not get all of the songs out of the way already? It seems like all of the great songs have already been written, and yet another great one comes along. How is that? Occasionally I think to myself, how is it possible to come up with something that is completely new, something that has never been sung before, that has never been written, never been played before, and yet... Day after day, year after year, people are always coming up with new songs and new music. It's because God created us to be creators who write and sing new songs to their creator. I think that's fascinating. Track number two is this. Why, why should we sing new songs? Why is God into new worship? Track number two is this, that God hates mindless worship. God hates mindless worship. See, we're, we're creatures of habit. Let's face it. We're creatures of habit. If you don't believe me, let me ask you this quick question. I'll prove it to you. How many of you right now, you're sitting in roughly the same spot that you sit in almost every week? Give or take a couple rows. That's right. It's like, this, this is my row. In fact, some churches are like, if you sit in somebody else's pew, you get to stare down. <laughs> By the way, I hope that never happens in our church. because You'll get a special visit from me if you make people feel uncomfortable because they're sitting in your pew. That's a whole other message. But listen, we're creatures of habit. We are. We, in fact, we do some of the same mindless things day after day. We put our pants on the same leg at a time, right? We, we put the, the same foot in first. In fact, if you don't believe me, if you ever hurt your foot and you had to put, a, put your pants on different, you're, you're, you're like, I'm not sure how to do it. I'm sitting on the edge of my bed and I can't figure out. I always put the right one in first, but my right one's hurt, so I can put the left one in. I might as well just go back to bed because I just, it's, I'm broken. I can't. We're creatures of habit. We do the same thing over and over again. And often as we don't even think about it. Unfortunately, that can happen with our worship too. Things that are familiar to us, sometimes we get into an unhealthy routine with things that are familiar to us. 
And so God doesn't want us just to have mindless worship where we go through the motions. I think God hates mindless worship. Listen to Amos chapter 5, verse 21 through 24. God says this. He says, I hate and I despise your religious festivals. Your, your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring, bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice offerings, choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. And he says, but let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream. So he's saying, listen, don't get stuck in, in just doing all these things. I want, you to, I want you to do things that please me. I want you to obey me. Scripture says to obey is better than sacrifice. Don't just get caught up in doing your things. But living in sin, doing, doing, your, doing your things with however you feel like it. I want you to think about this. When you're presenting an offering to God, I want you to think about it. Don't just go through the motions. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 1. He says, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and convocations. I cannot bear your, worth, your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast and your appointed festivals. I hate with all of my being. I have become, or they have become a burden to me, and I'm weary of bearing them. God, how do you really feel about this? Don't just get stuck going through the motions. I think God hates our mindless worship. And one of the antidotes to mindless worship is to sing new songs to our great God who makes things new every morning. In fact, I recently had a conversation with an older gentleman in our church, and he told me how he used to think this. He used to think, you know, why can't they just sing the songs from the hymnal? In other words, why can't we just sing those old songs? And then he said something that struck me. He said something to the effect that, that with these new songs, these new songs that we're singing, he, he goes, I, I can't even get through them without breaking down. It's amazing. When what he's implying is that, man, he's just so overwhelmed with the glory and the greatness of God that are expressed in the beauty and in the words and the melodies of these songs that we're so privileged to sing to our great God. And that certainly doesn't mean that the old songs are bad. That's not my point. Don't miss the point. The point is that sometimes we can find ourselves just going through the motions without even thinking about it. Oh, I know this one, and check. I'm just going to phone it in. And when we sing a new song, it breaks the mold of the familiar and it enables us to think and sing new and fresh words about a timeless God who never changes. I think God is in the new worship and the new songs. And I'm thankful for, for Brody who's always coming up with new songs for us to sing. Because it fixes our eyes on Christ. God created us to be creators, and then also God hates mindless worship. Track number three is this why does God love this new worship? Is that God's salvation deserves new songs. Deserves new songs. Let's see what the rest of Psalm 98 1 says. Psalm 98 1 says this Sing to the Lord a new song. Why? It says, For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. Now, now remember, if you've been with us for a while, we have kind of a definition for worship. We've used it for probably over a decade now. All right? So we don't have a new definition for worship. But the definition that we've used for worship is this. Worship is my response to God for who he is and what he does. It is a response. We, we think about how great and awesome and powerful our God is. And we respond to him. We don't just like, oh, wow, that's pretty neat. Thanks, God. There's a response to God. For who God is, his character, his attributes, his righteousness, his holiness. And then also it's a response to God for what he has done. His salvation for us. The way that he provides for us. All of those incredible things and blessings that we see God doing in our lives. So worship is my response to God for who he is and what he does. And I'm here to tell you the biggest reason why we should sing to the Lord, a new song is the salvation that he offers us. We take it for granted. And so we need to be frequently reminded of the salvation that he offers us. 
fact, so many of the songs that we sing talk about salvation. It talks about the new life. It talks about Christ's sacrifice and what he did for us. And it draws us back to the cross and what Christ has done for us. We think about Christ's salvation that he offers us. In fact, the writer of this particular psalm, we're not sure who it is. Is it David or Asaph or some other writer? We're not sure. But the writer of this psalm talks about God's salvation three times in three straight verses. I think he's trying to highlight a point for us. That salvation is so focal to our worship. Psalm 98, verses 1 through 3 says this, Sing to the Lord a new song. Why? For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen what? The salvation of our God. You think he's trying to illustrate something? Salvation is key and focal to our worship and the reason why we should sing new songs to our great God. Now, here, here's the deal. This is so huge. It's so huge, and yet we take it for granted. But listen, you need to know this. We've been included into the salvation that God offers. We've been included in that. And sometimes we're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, of course. Of course we have to. Listen, the salvation that God offers us is not just for Israel, his chosen people, but it is also for us as well. Verse 2, I love it, says, the Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. That's us. See, sometimes I fear that sometimes we, we think that well, of course, salvation is for us. We're Americans. I think that as Americans, we have a pride problem. We do. We have a pride problem. We think that the world revolves around us. Like, we're the greatest nation ever. And everything revolves around us. In fact, when I say that, some of you are like, yeah, I agree. It's true. America. America. Yeah, and this is what we think. We're thinking, well, we're the greatest nation ever. And everything revolves around us. Of course salvation is for us because we're so great. In fact, I think in some ways we're our own big. You want to think what the American idol is? It's us. We make ourselves an idol. We put ourselves above God. We think that we're so awesome. We think that it's because we're so awesome that God has blessed us. And yet we've got it backwards. It's because God is so awesome. Not us. See, the reality is God chose this little nation, the nation of Israel, and you read about their story all throughout the Old Testament of what God was doing among them. And God loves this nation. They're his favored chosen people. And then Jesus came. And salvation was made available to all the rest of us as well. Let's not take that for granted. Let's be eternally grateful that God has included us, that he has, he has crafted us in, so to speak, like, like a tree, like a, a tree that doesn't belong on this, on this particular stem or on this particular root. But you know what? We want to graft it onto this particular stem. And God does something amazing with that. And we've, we've been called his sons and daughters and we've been accepted into his family. This is such a huge thing for us. That salvation is also for us. It's not limited to us, but it is for us. So side A is this, that God is into new worship. Side B is this, God is into big worship. I believe that God is into big worship. Listen to the response of God's salvation. It's found in verse 4. The response to, to salvation is this. Verse 4 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with a harp, and with the, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Listen, track number one is this. I think our worship should be big. Our worship should be big. See, I get the feeling that God's not just big into music. I believe he's also into big music. That 
he loves it when his when his children hold nothing back and they give him full on no holding back worship. Not this half-hearted, not boring or reserved worship, but intense all-in worship. By the way, just my own personal opinion, I think heaven is going to be a little bit loud. I'm just saying. I think it's going to be intense. I think it's going to be incredible. And even if I'm wrong, you won't be disappointed. So, it's a win-win. It's going to be awesome. Did, listen, did you see that first word in verse 4? Can you tell me what that first word is? <laughs> it's what it's shout. It's shout. Can we try that just one time? Can we shout, shout, the word shout on the count of three? One, two, three. Shout! shout! Ah, that's not too bad. It's like, nah. <laughs> You ever gone to fireworks and been disappointed? You're like, oh wow, those really weren't that good. I had my expectations were up here. That's kind of how it was when we said show. Can we try that one more time? I'll give you a little run at it. You're like, I'm not used to talking in church. I'm giving you permission. Okay, count of three. I want you to shout the word shout. Right? One, two, three. Shout! That is much better. Congratulations, Obi Community Church. I think some of you just woke up. It's like, what just happened? <coughs> shout! Shout! It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Listen, shouting isn't quiet. Shouting isn't quiet. See, when it comes to worshiping our, our, our great God, we should use our outside voices. Not our inside voices, but our outside ver uh, voices. Why? Because He is worthy of our praise. It says, burst into jubilant song with music. I love that word burst. You know, it kind of caught my attention as I was reading this word this week. Burst. So I looked up the definition of burst because I wasn't sure what it meant, right? Just kidding. So this is the definition of the word burst. It means to break or to, to break open. Right? To break or to break open. To fly apart with sudden violence. What if our worship was a little bit more like that? And I'm not talking about like the bad kind of violence. I'm talking about the good violence. <laughs> is there good violence? Apparently. You know, we're supposed to burst into worship. It's supposed to be all on. It's supposed to be intense. In fact, whenever we use the word burst, it means something that is sudden or forceful. Doesn't it? Sudden or forceful. When pipes burst, it's not just this like occasional drip. Oh, the pipes burst. Drip. You see it? Wait another two minutes, you'll see another one. Drip. Oh, our pipes burst. Poor thing. You don't call the plumber for that, right? They burst. There's water everywhere. There's like four drops right there. When pipes burst, water pours out of them. It is no longer confined or restricted to the pipe. Houses burst into flames. People burst through doorways, right? And they're right in your face. Oh, I wasn't expecting you. And there they are. They burst through the doorway. Crowds burst into applause. We burst into tears. We burst into laughter. It's unrestricted. It's uncontainable. It's uncontrollable. Does that describe our worship? Or are we just like, well, I'm just going to burst in the song? Uh, no. It is intense. Our worship should be jubilant. You know, we saw some of that at Kingdom Mount, where people weren't holding back. Our worship should be big. Track number one, our worship should be big. Track number two is this. All of creation worships big. Did you know that? All of creation worships big. Love this. Verse 7 says, Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. You know what it means to resound? It means to echo or to ring out with sound. The writer of this psalm says, Let the sea resound. I think about the sea, I think about these ocean waves. The, the ocean waves are waving for the glory of God. Do you know that? They're doing the wave. They, they started that. The wave. Have you ever done the wave? We're going to try it. 
You're like, oh my goodness, we're in church. We don't do the wave in church. We do the wave at concerts. We do the wave at football games. We do the wave at places where we're excited to be. Ooh, got you there. All right. So we're going to do the wave at church. You don't have to stand. I'm, I'm fine with that, you know. But we're going we're gonna to try it from the front to the back. It's going to be a little bit hard for you to start it again in the, in the back and go forward. So once it gets to the back, I'm going to start it again. We're going to do it twice. All right. So just get prepared. Remember I had you raising your hand early? That's why. All right. It's getting you ready for it. Are you ready? You might need to do that a little bit. All right. I don't know if I've ever done that in church either. But here we go. So we're going to start it. Ready? You don't have to stand, but we're still going to do the wave. Okay. Here we go. We did the way. We got, we got a got request over here to do it again. We're, we're, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it one more time. I'm sweating. All right, here we go. Here we go. Okay, with the sound effect. All right. Some of you are thinking, I've never done this in church before. Listen, perhaps God is honored by that. Because God loves to see his children enjoying life and enjoying creation, enjoying being with his people in his place. It is so incredible when you think about it. Listen, the ocean waves, they never miss a beat. Do you know that? They never miss a beat. They never take a day off. <coughs> the ocean waves don't just wave on Sundays. You hear me? They wave all the time, 24-7. They do exactly what their creator, the Lord Almighty, created them to do. That should be us as well. I love this. It says, the, let the sea resound and everything in it. The, the world and all who live in it. You know who that includes? That includes you. You live in this world that God has created. And so we should worship God. And then verse 8 says, let the rivers clap their hands and the mountains sing together for joy. You ever find yourself next to a babbling brook? And I'm not talking about Jeff Brook. Okay? <laughs> I'm talking about... <laughs> Sorry, just not even here to defend himself. Perfect. All right. Have you ever found yourself next next to a babbling brook and you just hear you hear that and you're like, man, I can listen to that all day. It's just it's just one of those sounds. In fact, sometimes it, it, it can be so intense that it, it almost sounds like applause. You know. And so the psalmist says, "Let the rivers clap their hands." And it's such a, a beautiful noise that, that, that there, there are some, some people that find it so beautiful and so peaceful that they have sound machines that make the sound of the ocean waves and the sound of a, of a stream flowing next to them so that they can sleep at night. It's pretty neat how God's like, hey, I, I got a cure for your sleep. There you go. I made it for you. You just got to discover it. And it says, let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. I was thinking about that. I'm like, okay, I can, I can visualize or I can, I can hear uh, that the streams clap uh, for, for joy. But, but what about the mountains? What do those sound like? And what, how do the mountains uh, work together? How do they sing together for joy? And as I was thinking about that verse this week, I was sitting in my hot tub where I like to prepare my sermons. I know it's weird. So it was about 1130 at night. I'm sitting out in the hot tub. I've got my phone, which is waterproof. That's key. And, uh, you know, and I'm editing my sermon. I'm thinking about this. And, and it's 1130 at night. It's completely dark. I'm out there by myself. And, and so I thought, you know, maybe I just need to turn the jets off for a little bit so, so I can actually hear. And, and it was just so quiet. And I listened. And I heard the mountains sing for joy. I got to that verse. And, and, and I, hear, I hear crickets and tree frogs and peepers. And, and, and I, I hear a bullfrog in, in the pond next door, and they're singing together for joy. So there I am. I'm in the hot tub at night, and I got on my phone, and I recorded, and this is what I heard. Listen to this. They'll do that for hours and hours and hours. Isn't that peaceful? It's beautiful. Sometimes we just need to stop and listen. Listen to what creation is telling us as the mountains sing for joy. See, the mountains sing for joy when the wind blows through the trees, when the owls hoot, when the wolves howl, when the 
when the elk bugles, they're all singing together for joy. Now listen, some of those sounds, you're like, well, that doesn't sound beautiful to me. I don't love that sound. It may not sound beautiful to you, but I guarantee you it sounds beautiful to your creator because they're doing exactly what they were created to do. And we can learn a lesson from that. God has created us to worship and to worship big. Our worship should be big. All of creation worships big. And track number three is this. Our God is big. Our God is big. Verse 9, it says this. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. And he will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity. Listen, our worship is directed towards our big God. Our big, great, awesome, powerful, almighty God. Verse 9, don't let this slip by. He says, let them sing before the Lord. God is our audience. Our big God is the audience and the recipient of our worship. Earlier in verse 6, it talked about God being king. That he is our king. He is our majesty. He is the one who is most high. And because he is Lord and king, he is ruler over everything. And he deserves our best and our biggest praise. The rest of verse 9 says this, Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. See, we come to this phrase in here where it says that he will judge the world. And I've got, I've got to be honest with you. At first glance, that just doesn't seem to fit with me. For, for, you know, I, I read the rest of it, it's like, oh yeah, God's doing this amazing thing in creation. The word is shout and sing for joy in that new song, and, and God's going to judge the world. I'm like, whoa, wait, what was that last line? <laughs> it, it just doesn't seem to fit. So I, I had to think a little bit more about it. I had to like kind of dive into it a little bit more, and, and here, here's, the, here's the deal. Uh, I want to point out two kind of hidden tracks. And these hidden tracks are like tracks that, like, if you're not paying attention you know, if you're not really looking for it, you're going to miss it. You know, sometimes there's hidden tracks in a song, and you're like, oh, it's at the end, after like four minutes of silence, and then there's a, a, like a bonus track. So I, I want to show you uh, these two hidden tracks that if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss it, and, and, and perhaps you're not expecting it. So I want to highlight these things so we don't miss the message. Track A is this. Here's the hidden track. Track A is that God's judgment is righteous. God's judgment is righteous. See, for us, the word judge has all of these negative connotations, right? It has all of these negative connotations. And, and for us, we're, we're like, you know, I'm not sure about this, this judgment thing. And so we need to understand that God's judgment is not the same kind of judgment, the same kind of judging that us critical, judgmental, arrogant people do. <coughs> it's not that kind of judgment. It is a righteous judgment. That God's judgment is righteous and it's perfect. And we see God's righteousness talked about in other psalms as well. We see it in verse 2 of this psalm. We see it in verse 9. That God's judgment is righteous. Because God is righteous. So it's nothing like our judgment. See, one day, he will bring justice to this unjust world. Every wrong will be made right. Every injustice will be corrected. Sin will be eradicated. See, one day Jesus will return and he will judge the world and he will rule and reign. And at that time, all things will be made new. The curse will be reversed. And then all of creation will rejoice having been set free from the curse of sin. That's a good kind of justice. That's a good kind of judgment. So God's judgment is righteous. Track number two, here's the hidden track number two. Track B is this, that God's salvation is available. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. See, God doesn't just bring judgment to the world. God also offers salvation to the world. And it's better than that. It's not just to the world. It's to you. God offers salvation to you. Salvation and redemption and deliverance is for you. All you need to do is ask for it. 
You need to ask Jesus to be the forgiver of your sin and the leader of your life. If you need help with that, I would love to help with help in any way I can. Talk after the service, write something in your connection card, get a hold of me. We'll talk about how God gives us this salvation. See, it's a beautiful psalm, isn't it? Psalm 98, hopefully it's one of your favorites now. It's a beautiful psalm, and I want to just give us a couple application points. Three, actually. Number one is this. Hold nothing back. Hold nothing back. And I'm not just talking about just when you sing, but I'm talking about all the time. Hold nothing back before your great God. Give God your first. Give Him your best. Don't hold back. He deserves it. He is worthy of our praise. Number two, application number two is this. Prepare for worship. Prepare for worship. When we gather together, come ready to worship. See, sometimes, and, and I, I don't miss my point here, sometimes we, we think that Sunday is all about preparing us for the rest of the week. Right? And I think that's a great thing. Many times we get, we get to Sunday and like it charges us up and it kind of, kind of starts our week off right. I think that's a wonderful thing. But listen, why don't we use the other six days to prepare for Sunday as well? Let's use the six to prepare for the one and not just the one to prepare for the six. What you'll find and what you'll discover is that God is with you all week, not just one day a week. One way that you can do this is uh, uh, Brody's created a, a set list of, of all the music that we sing here at Obi Community Church. In fact, uh, so there's an OCC worship playlist. Uh, you, you, you can find it on our Facebook page for Spotify and iTunes and different things like that, Apple Music. So if, if you're, especially if you're new to our church, like, man, I don't, I don't know these songs. Or, or, you know, because we frequently do these new songs. You know, it's a great way to kind of familiarize yourself with some of these songs. So if, if you're new, or, or even if you just love to, to sing and, and, and love to hear God's worship uh, throughout all the rest of the week, it's a great way to be reminded throughout uh, the week of all of this incredible things, or all these incredible things that God has done for us. So that, that's one way that you can kind of prepare for worship. Third application is this. Make worshiping together a priority. Make worshiping together a priority. See, I, I believe that you can worship God anytime and anywhere. That is so true. You can worship God anywhere. But I also believe that something special happens when God's people gather together and they worship together. So make worshiping together a priority. Listen, I believe if you do that, if you make that a priority, number one, that you're not going to regret it. In, in fact, what you're going to discover is that God is honored by that. You're saying, God, I'm taking time out of my week just to let you know that you are still number one to me. To make worshiping together a priority. Listen, I hope that, that you're encouraged by this psalm, that you're encouraged by this message, but I want to just talk about it. I want us to do it. So we're going to stand, we're going to sing to our great God. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much.